Before you go anywhere, really, you should have some idea of QC and pre-processing. And I'll explain what I mean like this. So it kind of helps if you know something about your data before you put it in by a layout. And um, so this is really basic stuff, but it's amazing how many people don't do it uh, and don't do it properly. So you often with a sample, you know other stuff about that sample, OK? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you've downloaded from database, you don't get information. But quite often when you now download a public record set, and because of this idea of the minimum information about a microarray experiment, the Miami standard, which was introduced very early on in microarray analyses, then people have got used to storing metadata. And so metadata might be the sample type, so brain, macrophage, rat macrophage. Um, donor or replicate, you run a number of replicates. All those replicates might not be the same. If they've come from different animals, if they've come from different humans, you kind of want to know that information, okay? Because that will, you know, one of your replicates might not have worked. You want to be able to identify what samples have come from what individual. Uh, time, of course, is a variable, which might often be in your data. Uh, patient info, age, sex, ethnicity, strain. Uh, disease, these are all things that, you know, you often know about a sample, that's why you're often analysing them. And the other important thing is the batch or the date the data was generated. Yeah, better turn off my phone, man, <laughs> I'll go off in a minute. Um, so create a simple name for your samples, okay? And many, it's amazing how time people turn up my office and their samples are labelled like that and you go, well, what the hell is GSE 13453, you know? <laughs> especially when you give your beautiful sample to Arc Genomics and what it comes back with is an identifier like that, which you have no idea how that relates to the sample you gave them in the first place. So, you know, brain, control, two hours, replicate one. Something simple that you can read and you can get your head around, okay? All right. And then this other thing, because what we're going to be doing is essentially looking for patterns, then you must order your samples in a way that you understand the pattern, okay? So if you've got a time course, make zero hour on the left and put your latest time point on the right. Random them all around and you won't understand what the pattern is, okay? You understand patterns. If you've got replicates, put replicate one, replicate two, replicate three. Say very basic stuff, this, but very, very often people turn to my office and the first thing I have to do is go, okay, right, hold on. Let's just work out what we're dealing with here. You need to understand your experimental design because if you don't understand the experimental design when you go in there, you're never going to understand the answer. Okay, So it doesn't matter. All of this stuff is, is fairly basic for any analysis technique that you might want to use. When we pattern staring, it's, it's essential. Okay. Um, the other thing that you, we kind of forget about is that it's just data. You know, and data, by its very nature, just like every other type of data set that you might provide, can be t potentially flawed, okay? It isn't perfect, and actually that imperfections can be sometimes mixed up with what is biological variation. So technical variation doesn't have a sign saying, I'm technical. It doesn't tell you what the difference is between biological variation. So, you know, in terms of producing an array or, or, or an RNA-seq experiment, the amount of RNA you put in, whether it's degraded or not, whether it's contaminated with other stuff, how well that you labelled the sample, what method you used to label the sample, how the hybridization efficiency worked that day, the array quality, the equipment characteristics, which machine did you run it on, uh, you know, who actually ran it, what day of the week was it ran on, you know, <laughs> sounds a bit daft, but I know I remember in the early days, He's talking to some guy from farm, he said, oh, yeah, all the data we juice on Wednesdays, pff, never any good. Guess what? Anyway, so <laughs> data can be flawed and that f those problems will be come through. So all not data is good, not all data represents the experiment. So the other thing is, you go out, you do an experiment, and you go, actually, it may not have worked. How do you know it worked? <laughs> How do you know that those samples were pure? How do you know a lot of the things that you thought you were doing actually there? How do you know that some of those things that we just, just talked about weren't happening in your <laughs> sample? So again, apart from even just all the, the technical variation, there's biological variation. Animals vary, humans vary, and that's what you'll see in any given data set. 
So um, it's a very real phenomenon and you kind of just need to re learn to recognise it. It doesn't mean that the data is necessary. You can get round it quite often if it's not too bad, but you need to recognise it. You need to be aware of it and not misinterpret it as something that is there. So that's a kind of an idea of, of technical variation. So I, I don't know, most of you I hope are familiar with a box plot. If you're not, you should do. Um, so a box plot really takes this. So when you look at a microarray or any expression data set, you have a distribution of data. You have a lot of data at the low end, i.e. things, genes which are not expressed or expressed at a very low level. And then you have a further distribution of things which are expressed at a higher level. Now, quite often this is a bad idea, but you know that guy here is clearly an outlier. So a box plot really is a way of presenting that histogram or curve as a, as a box. So that's the 50th percentile where you're average expression, if you like, uh, 25th and 75th percentile, and that's the, the whiskers shown there. So that shows a big tail of the last 25% of your data. So you kind of, first thing to do is get any data set and have a look at the box plot, because instantly if you see something like that, that's going to be dodgy data, and you need to get rid of it. I think what becomes harder is when you start scratching it in, well, I really want to keep that sample. You know, it's quite important. <laughs> there, there is a kind of an emotional value when you've just spent a lot of time generating samples, you kind of get emotionally attached to them and you don't want to throw them away. But ultimately, you've got to be quite harsh about this thing. Uh, and we will generally run something called array quality metrics, and that gives you a kind of statistical value of throwing stuff out. So you leave it in, that's fine, but what's that what you, that's what you'll see within bio layout when you see it. You'll see that difference. So of course, when you what we all do is, is normalize it. Um, are we all familiar with normalization? What we're doing with normalization? Is anyone saying no? Okay. All right. I'll, I'll skip past the next two slides, which shows how we normalize data. But basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get rid of this technical variation by assuming that the, actually the overall distribution for the different samples should be the same. Okay, there are certain assumptions you make with normalization, and no data which is normalized, no matter how crap it was in the first place, will always look lovely after normalization. That doesn't mean that normalization makes bad data into good data, it just makes it look good. <laughs> okay, but underlying there's nastiness that you will find when you uh, look at it in, in other ways. So you can make data, bad data look good, but it doesn't make it good, if you know what I mean. So I won't go into how normalization works. So the first thing is the sanity check of any experiment is do your biological samples cluster. Okay, so can anyone spot a, an, an outlier on that particular sample tree? Your first test of the morning. Two hours six. Very good. Two hours six. This guy here. So you've got a small grouping here of one hours, one hours, two hours. So this is actually interferon treated mouse bone marrow derived macrophages, that these guys are all the early time points. Yeah, you've just added interferon to cells. The cells are just beginning to respond to that. They're all pretty similar. This guy's well over here, okay? It's a technical outlier. All the other samples, four hours, eight hours, 24 hours, kind of grouped together as they should do. Your two hour sample is already looking a bit suspect, okay? There's a number of ways of doing this. The sample tree is just one of them. What you'll often see is this PCA plot, principal component analysis. Most people don't really understand how it works, but basically it's a way of grouping samples together by the biggest movers in the data. Uh, but there's all this nonsense where you can do PCA1 versus PCA3. If you use Partech software, they're very proud of their 3D PCA plots. Again, what you're really trying to do is display data in a context where it says, are samples similar groups. So if you've analyzed two brain samples, they should look like brain samples. They shouldn't be clustering with liver. <laughs> you know, if you've done your time points, you know, the later time points should definitely look different from the early time points. This is the kind of basic biology that your biology should group together. And you need to be aware of that. Now, what I'll show you is how to use bio layout for doing this. So I much prefer now using the, um, so another way of looking at, at relationships between samples, and you'll often see these things, these heat maps, where you take each sample and you make a, a like a correlation analysis between it, and you make where samples are correlated red and those which are blue, very common. You can actually turn that, that's just a graph. Okay, so rather than looking at all relationships, you just look at the high relationships and then, so this actually came from the pig atlas, where we've got two bone, mar bone marrow-derived, unstimulated and with LPS, 
this is the unstimulated and uh, monocyte derived macrophages and the alveolar macrophages down here are related to other macrophages but they're further away. Okay, so it's just a way of measuring things and one thing I like about this approach is I get a measure of how similar samples are. The problem with the PCA plot, it's kind of difficult to know you know, where that is relative to that, you know, are they similar, you know, they're, they're, I don't know. It, I, I kind of like the idea that I know how similar things are on the edge. And the thing is, you can actually apply this to very large data sets, okay? So this is the way that we might QC. Um, so this is from the uh, primary cells, I think there's 745 samples here, where what we've done is made a correlation matrix and few things. Okay, make sure things fall into the right place.